but we're up to our last talk. So we have Cheyenne Tate. Favorite neurotransmitter is histamine, which like, whoo, came out of left field. I love that one. Uh, <laughs> University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she will be talking to us about multisensory integration and multidirectional connectivity in the nervous system of a nudibranch mollusk. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Hi, um, I'm very glad to be here and talk to you all today about nudibranchs. Um, I could talk about them forever. I'm going to try and make that not be the case today. Um, I'm a member of the CATS lab. We are all interested in neural mechanisms and behavior, so we're all neuroethologists. We focus on this one nudibranch species, Bergia stephaniae. They're about two centimeters long. They are kind of unique in the world of nudibranchs because they do not have to be field collected now. Everything in the past had to be. They can be reared continuously in the lab through um, all the generations, so that's very nice. And the view that I'm bringing to my lab is a uh, um, deep interest in sensory biology because what is behavior after all except the response to a stimulus? And if you can't sense that stimulus, right, there'll be no behavioral response. So to get into this, um, I think we can all agree uh, that brains vary across taxa. Um, as you can see up here, between the models mice and Drosophila and the nudibranch Bergia, brain structure is um, very different. Organization is grossly different. The size is different. And what I'm highlighting for you up here is the numbers of neurons present in these brains differ across orders of magnitude. Um, and my nudibranch Bergia stephanie um, is clearly losing with its 18,000 neurons. Or is it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even with only 18,000 neurons in its brain, Bergia exhibits a wide variety um, of interesting um, ecological, ecologically relevant behaviors. So Bergia in the big wide oceans, two centimeter long organism, can find and attack its food source. It's a specialist on sea anemones, and those anemones fight back the entire time they're being devoured. It can also find mates in the big wide ocean, and they are simultaneously hermaphrodites. They really do exchange sperm within seconds of each other, so this involves a very complex set of behaviors where they orient each other, and they also try to like beat each other. There's an element of sexual conflict here. It does all of this with 18,000 neurons, and that becomes a pro rather than a con when you're looking for neural mechanisms of behavior. Gastropods have been very famous in the field for their individually identifiable neurons based um, solely on um, position and morphology, and now that we're starting to crack into them and using C2 hybridizations and lots and lots of different antibodies, we can really identify these neurons on an individual level and connect them with behavior. Um, and also, it's not an accident that finding the mate and finding the food was listed as an important behavior, right? I'm interested in sensory systems. They need likely their olfactory system in order to do these. Um, that's the major long range cue for marine organisms because light and sound doesn't travel well underwater. Another interesting thing to note about the olfactory system, and this brings in this comparative lens that I also like to apply in my research, um, the olfactory system between the model systems of mice and flies um, converges on a lot of similarities despite the millions of years separating these systems. So if we look at the olfactory bulb of mice and the antennal lobe of flies, we see similarities in the olfactory circuitry of this first olfactory synapse. And um, this is a big question mark over here indicates. We just have no idea how this works in nudibranchs at this point. There is some research in other gastropods, but it conflicts massively, um, and it's from decades ago. So this is the gap that I'm going to fill. But first, just an overview of what I mean by the similarities between mice and flies. So um, in the mouse nose and the fly antenna, we have olfactory sensory neurons. They express um, a single olfactory receptor, which gives them a characteristic olfactory um, specificity. These neurons project to the brain in a very organized manner to this first olfactory synapse, the olfactory bulb, the antennal lobe. Um, all neurons expressing the same receptor project to the same bundle of neuropil called the glomerulus. Um, and um, from there, projection neurons take this information uh, fan out again and take this information to higher brain centers where processes like learning and memory can go on as well as multimodal sensory integration. The aims of my postdoctoral research are to address this structure, the, or this structure in Bergia. Does it exist at all and is it similar to mice and flies? So we'll start with sensory neurons in the periphery. Um, Bergia's major distance chemosensation organs, equivalent to olfaction are the, these two rhinophores on top of its head. These are another sensory modality we'll get to in a bit. Um, 
Another thing to remember, Bergia is a non-model, decidedly non-model, um, and does not have the molecular toolkit of flies. Or mice, I can't tag um, neurons by the olfactory receptor that they express and see where they go in the brain, nor can I tag, so, tag them with something like um, GFP and the olfactory marking protein and see just all the olfactory neurons at once. I have to be a little bit creative in all of the methods I'm going to show here today. So, and troubleshoot all these methods first. Um, so this is alpha beta tubulin, immunohistochemistry of the tip of the rhinophore, and you can just see that it's jam-packed with thousands of sensory neurons. They project their dendrites through the sensory epithelium, and they, the, this structure is also covered in a wild number of uh, cilia, so that it basically just looks furry under the microscope. <laughs> uh, this doesn't tell us anything about the diversity, how many different kinds of sensory neurons we have out here. Um, we also don't know much about what sensory receptors are out here. None of the deorphanization studies, et cetera, have been done. But something interesting we found in doing in situ hybridization of neuropeptides in the brain, just by chance, let's also do these in situs in peripheral tissues. We found that almost every peptide we were looking for in the brain is also expressed out here in peripheral tissues, which was kind of amazing to us. And if you zoom in on it, you can see that, yes, yes some, at least some of these, a lot of these are sensory neurons, again, with um, projections through the epithelium. And as I said, so these are all um, important molluscan peptides, and they're all being expressed out here on the rhinophore, um, imputative sensory neurons in different patterns. So there is a very diverse set of neurons out here, and there's a lot of um, modulation already going out, on out here with all of these different peptides being expressed in, in primary neurons. We are going to get into identifying the modality of these neurons by targeting very um, conserved chemoreceptor sequences. Um, this one is the first one we've got to. I've been working with a lot of undergraduate um, and graduate mentees. Um, Kelsey and Gianna contributed to this. Uh, this is IR25A, which is well known from insects, and it's also expressed all over the rhinophore of Bergia. Um, and it also recently reported in other models. So that was the first name. There are lots of sensory neurons out there on the rhinophore. Where do they actually project to in the brain, these thousands of neurons? Um, as a reminder and to show you some actual images of these structures, um, in mice and flies, this is the first olfactory synapse, the olfactory bulb, the um, internal lobe. Glomeruli look different between these two tags, so they're very round and countable. Um, in flies, there are thousands of them in mice. How do we do this in Bergia? We can't tag proteins um, in the same way. Um, but the nice thing about Bergia is that gastropods have this like semi-intact prep. I can dissect out the brain with the rhinophores directly still attached. All the nerves are attached. Um, and because these nerves connect to the rhinophore ganglion, on the semi-intact prep, we can just cut off the rhinophores, expose the nerves to these neuronal tracers, so it's using neurobiotin, and allow them to passively diffuse through the axon tracks into the brain and figure out where all this olfactory information is going. And it surprised us. We found that this olfactory information from the rhinophore nerves is going all over the brain to all the ganglia, including on the contralateral side. These X's mark, um, or through stereotyped axon tracks as well, these X's mark um, areas of organized neuropils that I'm going to talk about a few of them next. So in the rhinophore ganglia, which, right, it's the first, it's kind of the first stop along the pathway, it, it would almost intuitively be where, like, an antennal lobe, uh, olfactory bulb is, we see nerves, the, the large tracks are nerves that actually run through and continue on to the rest of the brain, but we do see terminals here um, which bear striking resemblance to how they appear in the olfactory bulb of the mouse. If we move along to this um, region of neuropil, which you can even see in the zoomed out version, but also much better at 60x, it kind of doesn't look, at, at first glance, it doesn't look like um, either of the two examples I've shown for mice and flies. But if we do a bilateral fill of both rhinophore nerves at the same time using different colored dyes, um, we uh, see um, er these areas of um, bilateral integration where the magenta and the cyan come together, showing that the, the projections of axons from both sides are coming together and being processed there. And when you focus in on these regions, they are the ones that bear this striking resemblance to Drosophila's glomeruli. They're very round and very contained. Um, and Drosophila, even um, the olfactory sensory neurons of Drosophila, do project across the co uh, commissure and um, um, innervate uh, corresponding 
glomeruli in both antennal lobes. So that's a similarity that we're seeing between Bergia and Drosophila at, at, in this nerve cell. So olfactory processing occurs in all regions of the brain. Where does processing occur of other sensory modalities? In these other taxa that I mentioned, it occurs later. But where does it occur here in this brain? The other senses of Bergia, right, I mentioned uh, this, these appendages before. The oral tentacles are um, chemo com combined chemotactile um, appendages, um, and the eye and the statocyst are located directly on the brain itself. The statocyst is for vestibular sensing. Again, when we do this thing where we use two different tracers at the same time, we um, see that the rhino, right, the rhinophore fill comes in um, uh, along these stereotype tracks, and we're not looking at this area now, we're looking at this area, this lateral neuropil. And when we fill the oral tentacle nerve at the same time, we can see that they are terminating in the same area. Um, the statocyst is ensheathed by the brain, and it's very hard to fill, fill that nerve at all. So instead, we are using histamine. <laughs> we're using histamine, which labels the hair cells of the statocyst. Um, and shows that they project um, into this same lateral neuropil. Um, and lastly, we, um, this is a messy fill, but it's OK, um, because we did successfully fill, as well as spill, um, the uh, dye into the optic nerve, um, which also um, is innervating this specific um, lateral neuropil of the brain. So we've got basically all the sensory modalities innervating this particular um, neuropil, and these are all primary sensory neurons, right? So they're coming to a neuropil, they're not going to a higher region to be processed, which is what I should have said on this slide, right? So yes, again, all sensory modalities are coming to this neuropil. This is the region we were talking about before with bilateral integration from both rhinophore nerves, and there are also um, intriguing uh, glomeruli-like structures up in the rhinophore ganglion, all stemming from filling the rhinophore. Um, so to summarize what I've shown you today, we have begun character only begun characterizing these sensory neurons in the periphery. There are thousands and thousands of them. They can be separated by their peptide expression. We're not yet sure how finely um, distinguishable they're going to be based on um, receptors that have known sensory functions, but we're going to get there via homology searches. We have shown that olfactory processing occurs in all ganglia of the brain in what looks to be specialized neuropils. And the location of processing other sensory modalities happens to be um, in one of these neuropils as well. Um, this lets us make a diagram similar to the very linear one that we showed for, that was shown for mice and flies. It is instead um, more distributed. But at the same time, it's dramatically different from flies and mice because the, this integration, although it's happening in many different places, it's happening the integration is also happening at this like first synapse where these rhinophore neurons are coming in. Um, so in comparison to those models, multimodal integration is happening earlier in the pathway. And this diagram also shows some immediate future direction. So I've grayed out, um, in comparison with the, with the models, I've grayed out the sensory neurons and I've grayed out like what's actually going on within these neuropils. Uh, a first path, right, is to fill in what's going on in these sensory neurons. Um, and like I mentioned, we're going to use homology searches for some things like IR25A, which are extremely well conserved, and with lots of data that is currently coming out from cephalopod groups, to try and figure out what kind of receptors are being up, expressed up here and how that data interlocks with the extensive and differential um, neuropeptide expression that we're seeing in these sensory neurons in the periphery. Um, I also did my PhD work um, in a non-model insect um, in intracellular and extracellular electrophysiology, which now that we know where some things, where some targets are in the brain, this is going to be a great way to investigate this further. So if I stick a recording electrode in any of these neuropils and then stimulate specific nerves or specific neurons, we can see what's actually going on. Perhaps it is that like some inputs are, are inhibiting other in inputs instead of exciting them. and. and and this is how we can see that. Um, and I'm also interested in um, getting more towards a naturalistic view of all these things that are happening and using um, behaviorally relevant cues, like their food cues, to see, again, what's going on in these various neuropil, these um, primary processing regions of um, Bergia's brain. The ultimate theme that I hope to have in my lab in the future um, is comparative sensory biology, is that of comparative sensory biology and behavior. Um, Bergia is, is a very strong system to do this in. 
because we can look at sensory systems and um, neural mechanisms possibly to the single neuron level across development. We can look across reproductive states, so during mating or during egg laying. And at some point, um, we can get to looking across species um, if we can find some that are amenable to being raised in the lab. But the, our lab strain also has um, wild counterparts that we could do comp uh, very interesting comparative things with. Um, and with that, I would like to um, give my acknowledgments. Um, my postdoctoral lab, the Katz Lab at UMass Amherst, students who contribute, whose data um, was shown today. The UMass Microscopy Facility, where I took all these awesome images on the confocal, leading edge for letting me talk today, my funding sources, and these are various um, supports I had during my PhD. Um, and thank you for listening. Very, very cool stuff. I think you alluded to this at the end, um, but are, are, are there behavioral assays that you can do with Bervia? Because it seems like, you know, you have a really strong, you could lesion an area and essentially see, does it cause a deficit, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, th these are kind of ongoing, many ongoing things in the lab with many different people working on them right now. Um, we kind of have a, like, T, a TY maze going on, like preference for olfaction, um, and I've also been doing lesioning experiments, they're kind of tricky because they regenerate so fast, <laughs> which is also interesting for like structures of olfactory circuits, but they regenerate so fast that you don't know if they've already regenerated everything and that's why they can now do the task. But yeah. <laughs> and then I, I was also just wondering if you could speculate about lateralization for the non-olfactory senses, right? That it doesn't seem like you identified a, a integrator for those senses, that they are they just like on one side of the brain? Yeah, um, so. They don't seem to have these contralateral projections of the primary sensory neurons like the, the chemosensory neurons seem to. But there is old literature and another new debrank where they're doing similar dye fills like this. And the, like, the interneurons that kind of surround that lateral region, they do project contralaterally. So it's just like at the next level, which would, the next level of processing, which is maybe more like normal with, with mice and Drosophila doing more of the integration at later stages. So they're, they're, they're probably doing this as well. Yeah. I was really struck by the cilia. I love cilia. Um, they look really cute and fuzzy. Uh, is there anything known about them? If they're sensory, if they're mechanical, if they're like help them, I guess, with their motility, like anything? Right. So um, at larval stages, they have like cilia that help them for moving. They actually swim and then they glide and then they switch more to like this, this muscular wave locomotion when they're adults. Um, but the cilia on the rhinophores, the rhinophore has also been shown to be like really important for flow sensing. Mm -hmm. So those cilia are likely mechanosensory, and that's kind of why I was talking about like the actual. We actually want to know the modality of all these thousands of sensory neurons because they might not all be olfactory. They probably are not all olfactory. This is really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Oh, I'll come to you too as I'm walking. Um, so that that region that's getting all this multi-sensory input. First of all, do you get to name it? And is it like a <laughs> tiny mollusk thalamus? Like what, what is this, you know? Yeah, um, I don't know. I've been calling it the lateral neurophil, but that's a fairly boring name. Um, yeah. Over dreams, let's name this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, excellent talk. Uh, I'm curious, like have you like access any species level variation in the, uh, chemosensory receptors of these slugs. And uh, I'm, I was also wondering, like, uh, do you have any hypotheses or any preliminary data, like uh, where about the olfactory responses, uh, like happens in the brain, more or less slug brain? Yeah, so, so <laughs> we haven't done any EFIS or functional, um, or like optical or ultrasensitive dye imaging yet, right? But these neuropil regions suggest that, that this is where the like olfactory responses would be occurring is these neuropil regions. Like we need to stick, we have to stick electrodes in there. I, ha I have to do it. Um, <laughs> but, but also your other question, species level differences um, in olfactory receptors. Um, yeah, so, so what has been happening to us is that we occasionally run out of their food source. The slugs are easy, the anemones are hard. We run out of the anemones, the slugs get incredibly starved, and then all of our like in situ um, go crazy. So, so we don't see anything anymore. So there's going to be, and, and because we're doing this all at the mRNA level, I don't know if differences that we see in our images 
are because of down regulation of expression of these ORs, uh, not IRs, um, or whether they actually differ. But yeah, future work, future work. All right. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for attending the neuroscience session.